Hello and welcome to another episode of the glorious, gorgeous, fully charged show podcast. Oh my lord, this episode is like really, really good. I really want you to carry on listening because this is going to be brilliant. So um, I think it was about 12 or 13 years ago, I used to make a, a video series that was on iTunes and YouTube called Carpool. This does predate by a considerable period of time. Jerry Seinfeld's Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee and also um, Carpool Karaoke. Uh, you know, not that Carpool, the one I did, was original. People have put cameras in cars before and recorded the consequences. But I did it a lot. So I have about 140 episodes of Carpool I made, 99% of them completely on my own. Uh, it was a kind of experiment in, in new broadcasting at the time. A very wide variety of guests. They're all still on, not all of them, loads of them on YouTube. Somewhere they're buried in the um, in the basement of iTunes, which doesn't exist anymore. I don't even know how you'd find those. That's where all of them are. Um, anyway, so one of those guests I had when I was doing Carpool was a man called Cory Doctorow. He's a science fiction writer, a, a digital rights activist, an incredible intellect, an incredible communicator, an extraordinary man. And I drove him across London. Uh, he was going to a big uh, conference in America at the time. This would have been about 2008. And we were in a Prius. That's what I filmed the Carpools in. Um, and it was an amazing uh, journey, and he inspired me uh, to uh, try and self-publish my own books, which I never managed to do. I'm not well organised. What he does, and he's brilliant at it. Uh, he, he'll talk about that a bit in the podcast. But um, so he was just really encouraging and inspirational, and he's really good at sharing everything. And he really believes that we need to own our digital rights and that people are, you know, which we know. We kind of, he's been talking about this for decades, but now we all know. Oh, does Facebook uh, <laughs> exploit your data? <laughs> like, it's such a stupid thing to even ask. Does Google know everything about you and sell it? Yes, yes, they do. They all do that. That's how they make money. That's why they're so rich. Um, and they supply a good service that we use and, and we appreciate, and that's fine. And the the deal for that is fairly brutally in their favour. He's known that forever. He's talked about it forever. But there, so I wanted to talk about because what? So he writes these brilliant science fiction books. I'm in the middle of one now. Attack Surface. It's just he's very clever with his science fiction ideas. And I wrote three science fiction books. This is where all the, you know a lot of our conversations came out of this. He's better than mine. I'm not even going to begin to argue. But if you ever want to read one of mine, I would argue, I would suggest there's a book called News from Gardenia. And it's on Amazon. I mean, that's probably the only place you can get it now. It was in bookshops for a bit, but this is a few years ago, uh, which is set 200 years in the future. His stories are set often like 10 minutes into the future, but constantly a little bit further ahead. But, you know, really clever stuff. He is now working. This is why I got in touch with him. He's now working on a book that is about... The, the the Green New Deal. So it's about what the, after we've completely revolutionised the way we consume, produce energy, the way we think about energy, the way we use electricity, what we use it for, how it's made, who owns it, who has the rights over it, what that does to the world when that changes, all that stuff. Really fascinating stuff. He's a real deep thinker about all those issues that are brought up by new technology. Um, so we had an amazing talk. But... Before we start that, I just want to bring you a, this is so exciting, I love doing this, a message from our sponsor. Because now wait, don't go and skip ahead, just wait for this, because this is a really interesting opportunity. This isn't selling something. This is a very, very important announcement from, from Ripple Energy. Now you can't go onto a website and buy your electricity from Ripple Energy. That isn't how this works. That's not what this is about. This is much more interesting than that. Ripple Energy enables you to make a genuine impact on climate change by part owning, part owning a large wind farm and having the green electricity it produces supplied to your home via the grid by Octopus Energy. So you don't have to go with Octopus Energy, but if you uh, uh, buy shares in Ripple Energy, you are helping them to fund to build new wind farms. They've already built some. They want to do more. It's, this is greener than a green tariff because by owning it, you're actually helping to get new wind farms built. It's not rocket science. It's, it's, it's air wind turbine science. It's wonderful. 
and it's it's a lot cheaper than putting solar panels on your roof now i can confirm that it is definitely cheaper and if you uh, live in an apartment or in a rented house or in any sort of accommodation that is that you don't own then uh, you know putting solar panels on your roof is not necessarily going to benefit you and what happens when you move can't take them with you I suppose you could you could rip them off the roof and shove them in the back of the car but it's not you know it's not what you're going to do but if you've bought shares in ripple energy you it doesn't matter where you live you can take them with you you still own them uh, until now owning big green energy assets was only possible for really big businesses and investors but ripple enables everyone to get involved so you can check out their website and that's easy to find do you know what i put this into a a web search engine browser i put in rippleenergy.com literally all one word ripple r-i-double-p-l-e energy.com got went straight there found the website it's not hard to find got the info off it so it's really easy to do so the um ownership of a wind farm starts from just 250 pounds that you invest in it now, you know you invest it you're not just giving it giving it to them out of charity um and our ripple was awarded startup of the year twice last year in 2019 it's really an exciting company i know some of the people who work there they are amazing um uh, so it's really worth having a look at this. Ripple is also crowdfunding on the Cedars investment platform at the moment. Now, that is interesting because that is the same investment platform that Fully Charged Show used very successfully to sell some of our shares, to raise a bit of money, to, which thank goodness we did that before this year because we wouldn't be here if we didn't. That has helped us to survive this year, which has been really a blessing. So you can become an owner of a bit of Ripple as well as own a bit of a wind farm. So it's really important that I remind you that if you do decide to invest in Ripple, your capital is at risk and that Cedars have approved this this so and cedars are, are very very strictly legal about what you can and can't say and what you can and can't do and how you sell shares and all that we had to go through it so cedars are really you know cedars and ripple are reputable decent folk who aren't out to rip people off so you will be investing in it and you've got to think of it in the long term but you can start from 250 quid so it's not the biggest risk in the world obviously you can invest more than that if you wish so i want to thank ripple energy for helping fully charged to keep going by sponsoring this episode and now without more ado please welcome to the fully charged show podcast mr cory doctorow I've just, oh, I've just been, <laughs> I've actually never looked at your Wikipedia page before and it's terrifying. <laughs> it, goes, it just goes on and on. Oh, uh, well, it does go on and on. That's true. Uh, don't feel any need to summarize all of it. No, no. But I, can I, I want to read out a line that was in it, a quotation from you, because I just think, I just, because the last time I saw you, just to explain to our listeners, was a, I reckon about 2008 it was just before you left like you were still living in London and oh, we left in 2015 but if my oh, daughter had just been born it was around 2008 yeah so 2008 2009 yeah. she was a, I know she, you had a baby at home anyway yeah. and that was in London but then when you left oh you left London in 2015 right yeah that's right sorry so uh, what you said was <laughs> and this was pre the Brexit vote you said London is a city whose two priorities are being a playground for corrupt global elites who turn neighborhoods into soulless collections of empty safe deposit boxes in the sky. <laughs> it's so it's so horrifyingly true. Well, you know, it's not as safe an investment as, as it was before Brexit. No, so there's no, that. That's true. When life yes. gives you SARS, you make SARS barilla. I because that what got re, got me really excited is when we had a little a conversation on Twitter. It was really the because I'm, I'm now listening to your latest audiobook, which I love. Oh, great. The Tax Surface. So, and, I, and it's really reminded me, because one of the, the first book I, of yours I read was um, Down and Out in the Magic Kingdom, which I ah. forgot. You know, now I read that. When did that come out? I don't know. 15 quite, years ago, yeah. Right, yeah. So 20 years ago. After that, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. It, but that's suddenly come back to me. And I just, so I'm really enjoying that. Oh. Which I'm, so I'm very happy to plug it like mad and tell people to, sure. to, like, to, yeah. to look at it. Give For it sure, I'm happy to. Yeah. <laughs> Attack Surface. Uh, yeah, so Attack Surface is the third Little Brother novel. Yeah. Uh, it's the um, uh, sequel to these two young adult novels, Little Brother and Homeland. 
And while those are novels about uh, teenagers uh, beating back the forces of technological uh, surveillance and control using technological insurgency, uh, Attack Surface is a novel about one of the people who works for the other side, a young yeah. woman who spent her whole career working as a surveillance operative first uh, for the U.S. government and then as a military contractor and then as a cyber mercenary crushing democratic revolutions in the former Soviet Union, who has to have a reckoning with her work, who has to uh, uh, eventually stop rationalizing what she's done and recognize the human cost of it. And the thing that precipitates that is uh, going home to San Francisco and realizing that uh, her best friend, her childhood best friend, who's now a Black Lives Matter activist, is being targeted by the very same cyber weapons that she spent her whole life mm -hmm. developing. Yeah. And, you know, she uh, is, is meant to be something of a proxy for all of us who, over the decades of neoliberalism, have had to make compromises and compromises and compromises mm -hmm. that come at human expense and who have to make a choice, right? Are we going to just go on pretending that the way that we're living is sustainable and that it's not harming others? Or are we going to take a long, hard look in the mirror, realize that we don't like the person we see there and commit ourselves to uh, working together to change it? And, you know, those first two books inspired a lot of people. I've heard from lots of cyber lawyers and activists and security researchers and so on who've come along and said, uh, you know, the reason I got into this field is because I read Little Brother and Homeland. Wow. And they wow. convinced me of the power of technology to liberate us and of the power of technology to enslave us. Yeah. And I knew which side I wanted to be on. And, you know, there's a scene in Citizen Four, the Snowden documentary that Laura Poitras made, where Snowden is bugging out of his hotel room in Hong Kong and going into exile. And he grabs the stuff he's going to need. And one of the things he grabs is a copy of Homeland. Wow. Uh, which is amazing. Wow. But, you know, the, all of the stuff that's being used to manipulate us, to harm us, to surveil us, it's being built by people whose relationship with technology almost certainly started with the exuberance of realizing how powerful a computer yes. is once you master it, and who devoted their lives to making sure no one else feels that power. And I wanted to, <laughs> to, to speak to that fracture line. I wanted to help those people along to create some early stage Oppenheimers who don't wait until after they've developed the nuclear bomb to regret it, but instead yeah. <laughs> pull back from the brink, you know? Yes. That is, that is beautiful. Thank you. No, that is really interesting. But so the reason I really wanted to talk to you is, is because of, you know, what, what I've been involved in the last 10 years, which is, and it's taken me many years longer than it will have taken you to understand this, but the transition that we are uh -huh. seeing in, in the, in the field of energy and transport in particular, but, uh -huh. but mainly in energy, it is quite breathtaking. The speed, the spread of it, the complexity of it, the challenges it faces are just extraordinary. And I mean, that is really the area that I believe you are now sort of thinking about and, and, and so the book i'm working on now is very right. much about that and you know i'm speaking to you from burbank california where we have a solar roof and an electric vehicle that that runs off the sunlight right. so it's that, that's definitely where our lives have have moved yeah yeah i mean that, isn't that extraordinary that you know even in the time when i met you when i drove you to heathrow that day uh -huh. you, you know it would have not been possible at that time unless you were you'd have to be a really advanced engineer with a degree in electronic engineering to charge an, a pure electric car with, from solar panels and drive that distance you know that was yeah. beyond our ability we were in Absolutely. a Prius we were in a, a, a petrol a hybrid. hybrid yeah, yeah. and so yeah. that has changed in that period of time and so you can now charge your car you don't have to go to a gas station and pay for gas you just yeah. Yeah. And in fact, you know, in Southern California, we get to use the, the um, bus lanes, you know, we get to use the HOV lanes right, and yeah. we get uh, preferential parking at the grocery store in <laughs> a kidding? parking spot oh, with goodness. a, with a charger. Right. Uh, it's, it's quite, it's quite amazing. Uh, it's interesting to see how the policy stuff uh, works. It's yeah. also interesting in the context of climate justice, because, you know, for all that this is lovely for us, the reason we can afford it is that we're affluent. And so, yes. you know, they're, they're, the, the, we, it is not enough to provide incentives to people who have choices. Yeah. We have to provide choices to people who have none. Yeah. And that's a piece that's, that's really missing. And, you know, we've just probably had the most consequential ballot initiative in terms of energy and wages and opportunity 
in in California history where Proposition 22, the most oh. expensive ballot initiative in history, just yes. passed. And what that does is allows gig economy companies to continue misclassifying their employees as contractors. Right. And so they are currently, you know, the the whole gig economy rests on the uh, inability of low-waged workers to do amortization calculations uh, because once you amortize your vehicle, you are uh, often uh, at zero wage or negative yeah. wage. Wow. And, you know, that is a perverse incentive to keep older cars on the road longer. And maybe, you know, if we could, right. if we could absorb some of the upfront costs, if we could give them, you know, EVs to... To, to start out with that didn't turn into uh, like an EV, um, you know, higher purchase that effectively yeah. made you a debt slave to your EV forever. But if there was just yeah. some way to replace that fleet with an EV fleet, it would, it would make some difference, right? It yeah. would make some improvement. I mean, that, yeah, that is the thing that I've, you know, I've done public speaking on this for many years. And the, I always start out with electric cars won't save the world. <laughs> you know, they're not yeah. the answer. They're not the solution. I mean, sure. I think what they do genuinely do is, you know, which I think everyone who's had one, it suddenly goes, oh, where does the electricity come from? Oh, wait a minute, I can make it myself. I mean, those right. steps. And it opens that door to understanding sure. the kind of matrix that we have lived in and, and is normal to us. You know, burn fuel, send power yeah. down wire but turn switch light but, comes on you know so. you know the thing that excites me about the european green deal the green new deal the leap manifesto is the recognition that climate justice needs to address historic inequality yeah and and you know it's um to, it's in some ways the inverse of something like the congestion charge which uh turned uh uh the right to drive on London streets into a, a, a regressive tax. Yeah. The man with a van who comes in from zone four uh, and is barely eking out a living is, is hit very hard by yeah. the sea charge. And the, the posh city boy who comes in from Chelsea it, and 15 pounds is, yeah. isn't even noticed no, no. and you know you contrast that i don't know how you would administer but you contrast it with something like the finnish system for um traffic fines where it's keyed to your wage and yeah. so you know i don't know if you remember infamously there was a nokia executive who was really bombing down the motorway yes. and got a ticket for ten thousand euros yeah yeah. Because, the, you know, the, the idea is to provide a disincentive and the disincentive has to be keyed to your wage. Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, that's the thing about, you know, when I cycle across London now, which is, well, I haven't done it this year, but last year, last time I did it, uh, I'm, I'm surrounded by the highest end vehicles sure. that are available on the planet. And there's no, there's no sort of battered third hand Volkswagen. It's all yeah. very bad. And that's who can afford to drive into the middle of London. You know, they don't, they don't, yeah. Yes, it is a, a quirk of that thing but i mean i don't know because i don't know that it's improved the air quality but certainly uh the lockdowns we've had have made it that's one of the things i want people to remember i mean that has made yeah. a really big people remembered that the air smelt better in cities oh in, is, in los angeles it was um it was i mean to use a local term cinematic right right you know we we, we live around the corner from griffith park and we go and we'd hike up to the top of the hill and I swear to you, we could see Oregon. Wow. Like it was, yeah. it was spectacular. You could not believe how clear the, the air was. I've never seen that in Los Angeles. I've been there many yeah. times. I've never seen it. Yeah, there's always a haze. Wow, that must have yeah. been incredible. Wow, because that I mean that was the uh, it, it was definitely working in California in the early noughties that I yeah. became aware of the notion of electric vehicles. The uh, the California Air Resource Board, the EPA, yeah. all those stories kind of leaked into my consciousness when I was there, which kind of started me on this journey. It took a right. long time. but California's early, capacity to, to, to export policy around the world in the same way that the GDPR exports a privacy policy around the world, because it's such a major market. Yeah. If you're going to comply with California laws, it, it's maintaining two sets of tooling and two lines and two yes. groups of firmware and so, so on. And especially when the price for getting it wrong is very high, yeah. uh, oftentimes, you know, companies just, just throw in and, and do it. Uh, you know, I, I was thinking about what I wanted to talk to you about. I don't know if you, what you had in mind. Uh, please, I want you to choose. <laughs> but I want to <laughs> talk about um, uh, a kind of science fictional wonky 
sort of hard to articulate way of thinking about uh, alternative energy right. that uh, I've been trying to like nail down. I wrote this book called Walk Away in 2017 that really uh, gets at it. And then I've got another book that I'm almost finished now called The Lost Cause. That's a, a post Green New Deal utopian novel about truth and reconciliation with white nationalist militias right. that also tries <laughs> to get at it. Uh, but it's it. it it's the idea that, you know, obviously the problem of, of uh, renewables is baseload. Uh, yeah. And all of our battery stuff has the smack of pie in the sky. You know, either we, we maintain the pretense that we can use water levels to, uh, like, like, you know, pumping a, a lake storage. into a mountain yeah. and back. Yeah. That, that, first of all, that it's energy efficient. And second of all, that it's not like environmentally devastating yeah. to do this. It's, you know, just sort of moving it off to, one, to, to another place and so on. And, and also... You know, the, the thing about, about baseload is that we're going to have a pretty high baseload in the years to come as we remediate climate change because we're going to have to do shit like over the next three centuries, like relocate every single coastal city 20 yes. kilometers inland. Yeah. Like the Thames Estuary, Thames Estuary is toast. I don't care yeah. how big the barrier is, no. right? If, 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 you're, if you're, I don't know, south of Islington, you know, like forget it, yeah. right? And, and so it, it's, it's going to be, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to make a lot of like carbon intensive materials like concretes and yeah, yeah. maybe we'll do it with like fungus or whatever yeah. all these ideas but you know there's no getting around it and the thing about renewables is that it's feast or famine right oftentimes when the when the sun is shining you know when we put in our our solar our city capped our solar generation at 1.25 percent of our median monthly over the past 12 months. And the reason is that they can't absorb the power fast yeah, enough into yeah. our grid, right? Like they literally just, you know, they can't flare it off, yeah. right? They've got nothing to do with it. And we do have a solution to this where we have things that need to be done, but it doesn't matter when they're done. We have um, uh, energy intensive processes that absorb that extra power. So if you go near any hydroelectric dam or any other source of, of intermittent high, uh, uh, variably priced power, you'll find an aluminum smelting plant yeah. because we need to, or aluminum, we need to smelt a certain amount of aluminum for our industrial processes, including making lightweight EV bodies and yeah. windmill blades and whatever. Right. And, and it's super energy intensive. So if you've got an extra electricity, aluminum can be like a battery, right? Yeah. What it is, is it's removing aluminum from your baseload, right? It's, it's, so you are, what you're doing is actually reducing baseload yeah. by using your excess up. And, uh, the reason we can do that is because of our coordinative capacity that comes from computer networks. And this is kind of my, my background. I, right. I'm a visiting professor of computer science at the OU. And, you know, the, the, I've been involved in the tech industry and in tech policy for all my life. And the, the most significant thing about networked computers and the people who use them is their capacity to organize our labor with fewer hierarchies and more flexibility. So mm. the dark side of that is Uber. The bright side of that is Wikipedia, right? right. Where we can, we can build an encyclopedia with the kind of hierarchy that we used to devote to like a really ambitious bake sale, right? And, and imagine if we could deploy that coordinative work in a humane, worker-controlled, human-centric way, mm. where when the sun is shining, the factory turns on. When the sun stops shining, you get a day off, right? That that the and that and that the network allows you to coordinate all the complexities that arise from that variable scheduling. So much of the way that we organize our working lives and therefore our energy consumption is is about resolving the coordinative issues with your kids' school day, your spouse, mm -hmm. social engagements. Uh, traffic patterns, uh, you know, all of that other stuff. Mm. One of the great gifts of mobile telephony has been the improvisational and fluid social arrangements that it gives rise to, right? The ability to like just find yourself in central London of, of an evening and send out a message to your friends that says, anyone around, maybe we go see a movie, mm. right? I am old enough to remember <laughs> when, when you wanted to see a movie, you had to ring your mates up the day yeah. before, arrange a time to meet. If you wanted to do something that fluid and improvisational, I remember pumping quarters into payphones in Toronto, calling my friend's mum and saying, if Zach calls, let him know that I'll be at the Odeon at seven. Otherwise, I guess I'm seeing the movie on my own. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Oh, God, yeah. 
Right. So we like this, you know, the Soviets tried this. They, they tried giving everyone a different weekend. It was a complete disaster. Husbands had different weekends from wives. Are you kids kidding? I did not. From... I've never yeah. heard that. It's I... like it was like post-revolutionary French metric times, yes. that, yeah. you know, the metric calendar that nobody ever yes. liked. <laughs> but it was because they didn't have coordinative technology. Right. right. It was because like you could like figuring out, first of all, solving the problem of when are you given gardening leave such that you are being given gardening leave at the people who matter to you, like your kid and your, your spouse and so on. Mm. That involves a lot of computation, right? Big yeah. databases crunched a lot. It, it, you have to be able to resolve things like people going, no, 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 uh, not today. Uh, I need it next week off because we've got a big plan. Yeah. You know, all of that stuff needs to be manageable. That's a thing we can do with computers now. Right. now. And so here's like, I know that's just a lot of word salad, but yes. here's my vision, right? Is, is you get up in the morning and if there's a good wind or a lot of tide or a lot of sun, everything's as per normal. Right. And if not, you just, um, you know, you get a message saying, take the day off. Here's all of your friends who have the day off. Here's a list of them. Here's right. what they're looking for friends to do with, right? Swipe right or swipe left. You know, your spouse has also automatically got the day off too, so right. that you can have a day off and have a picnic together. Uh, you know, you, uh, everything gets kind of rejiggered. If it's like a doctor, the appointments get moved around. And the base load falls to almost nothing because yeah. our, our industrial usage falls to almost nothing except when there's excess capacity in the system, at which point it expands right. to fill the whole volume. And, you know, this is the rhythm of, of human pre-industrial life that you make hay when the sun shines. Yeah. And then the rest of the time, you know, you do a little pickling, you do a little canning, you do some knitting, you sit by the fire, you tell stories, right? It's recapturing that, yeah. but in a high tech, high intensity urban way. And yeah. the urban part's really cool because, you know, if you're stuck indoors with your family whom you can't stand for the cold winter, that's brutal, right? Yeah. If you live on like the end of a lonely country road. But, you know, if you're in a, a vast teeming city with every culture, every idea, every cuisine, every cultural activity you can imagine, yeah. plays and sports and all of the things, and they just kind of spontaneously spring into existence, Right, the moment that the, the moment that we, we're all furloughed for the day, and then gracefully wind yeah. down when the sun comes out again, then then you know that's how we'll build the prefabricated con uh, uh, construction materials to relocate all of our cities. Right, right. That's how we'll like we'll we'll just we'll use concrete like a battery. We'll solar center low clinker concrete yeah. in the middle of the Mojave whenever there's more sun arriving than we can, than we can, we can uh, manage, that. right? Yeah. And so that's like I, the, the, our, the whole like, what do we do about baseload discussion is like, it's like the discussion about what we're gonna do with all the horse shit as more people move into London and horse-drawn carriages yeah. proliferate, right? Like at a certain point, you just gotta say like, we're just not going to have that arrangement anymore. Yeah. It's not that yeah. we're going to, it's not that we're going to be up to our necks in horse shit. We'll just, we're not going to have horses anymore. <laughs> yes. yeah. Right. Like that's our answer. Right. Yeah. And maybe our answer to baseload is we just. We won't have baseload. We don't yeah, need it. We use, yeah. We use coordinated capacity. You know, there's a Google data center in the lowlands in Belgium that um, has no chillers and chillers are the most uh, energy intensive part. Yeah. It's the, it's the only expensive, you know, recurring costs, the capital costs are what they are, but the, like the marginal cost of operating a data center, it's all chillers. Like the human labor is even the most expensive network engineers and SREs and stuff. They're just, they're just like a, a drop in the bucket when it yeah. comes to keeping those, those servers cool. They just turn the, the, they're located in a place that's cold enough that two thirds of the time they don't need chillers. And the rest right. of the time they just turn the data center off and send everyone home. Right. Wow. And that is cheaper that than is extraordinary. running it year round. Yeah. Right. So just imagine that model proliferating to every field of human endeavor. And instead yeah. of like, oh shit, I wish I had the day off yesterday when my wife had the day off. Everybody like this stuff just manages itself. Yeah. Right. The schedules just swap. You know, if you like, if your spouse says, Hey honey, let's go out and you've got the day on, on and someone else is off, you just put your name in a hat, like you put your name in the system for like, find me a person looking for a shift swap and you right. get the shift swap and it just, it just comes back like within 30 seconds and says, sorry, no shift swap today or, oh yeah, your shift swap, don't worry about it. It's all gonna, it'll all balance out in the wash. Don't right. worry, yeah. right? That is a, an arrangement that I believe actually 
gets us through an energy transition and into a stable long-term reconfiguration that is bright green, right? That's not right. based on degrowth. It's not based on somehow magically making 4 billion humans disappear, which yeah. is, you know, like we can call it degrowth. That's just genocide, yeah, it's gen right? I hear that more often than I want from, yeah. from people on what you would classify the liberal left. Going, there's oh, too well, many of us. And I go, well, there's too, it's not, yeah, which there simply isn't. It's, anyway, it's another topic. That way lies mean... ecofascism, yeah, yeah, right? I mean, yeah. that, that, and you know, it's in the core of the conservation movement, the Sierra Club, they all had ecofascist roots. Yeah. Harden, Tragedy of the Commons, these were raving ecofascists. Right. And you know, for people who think I'm using that term, uh, uh, like as a, a hyperb hyperbolically, ecofascist is literally someone who believes that we have to abolish democracy and freedom so that we right. can save the planet uh, by like sterilizing useless people yeah. and uh, you know kind of moving pushing people around. Right. That yeah. that's that, I mean, that is a literal you know strain. Uh, Hitler was an ecofascist. Yeah. You know this is why like the 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 Reich's uh, iconography was full of like. Uh, you know, apple cheeked Aryans playing in fields yeah. because they were going to get rid of all the useless people. And then yeah. there would be like, um, you know, Lieben's round for everyone. So ecofascism is like, a, it's a real thing. Yeah. And it's, it's not hard to slip into if you start thinking of humans as the problem. Yes. You know, Bruce Sterling, the, the, the science fiction writer uh, and ecologist, he has this thing called the dead grandfather test for ecological uh, measures. And he says, if there's a proposed ecological measure that your dead grandfather can do better than you by dint of the fact that he is dead, then it will not succeed. <laughs> right. That's and it is, it is absolutely yeah. the core of ecofascism that yeah. like, they just, there's a lot of stuff and, and hair shirt, hair shirt greens, right. Yes. That there's just a lot of stuff that um, it's like, well, do you really, I remember like people going like at the start of the lockdown, well, do you really need a walk? Like, what if you take a walk and then you have to use a bleach wipe? Where do those bleach wipes come from? Trees? You know, like, uh, that can't be our standard, right? No, the standard can't no. be just sit as still as possible and molder quietly yeah. so that you walk gently on the earth. We need a, we need a way to cohabit with the earth that, that acknowledges human thriving. Yeah. But also, I think the thing that we would find if we could jump forward to the world you described with the, the zero base load and the, the, I love it, the fluctuating system that, that means you don't work. But I think what people might discover is, God, I'm working all the time <laughs> because <laughs> actually, you know, that's one of the things we've discovered here really is, is, since you lived here, I suppose, since 2015, it's really, really where it's changed is the offshore wind. It doesn't, it is like literally yeah. some hours every year when it's not producing enough to measure you know 99 percent of the time it's chundering it out and we have problems now with uh you know there are we excess now have uh, you know excess capacity you have negative uh, costs you can actually for instance charge your electric car and get paid to charge it because you're using mm -hmm. some of that excess capacity which is you know and those well, things are temporary you know it's a sort of glitch yeah i mean once what we, as as i say uh climate adaptation has an almost infinite energy budget that we need to yeah. fill Right. Yeah. So, you know, we're going to, there's, there's we'll a find lot ways of using it. Yes. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, just, just, um, rebuilding, weatherizing and rationalizing the housing stock in London, as well as like, you know, making it adequate because it's so grossly yeah. inadequate now, yeah. you know, and, and figuring out how to redistribute it too. I, you know, it must be said whenever we talk about British housing, uh, the, the, you know, Greater London has more empty bedrooms of a night yeah. than at any time in history. It's just really badly distributed. Yeah. Uh, there's a geographer at Oxford uh, who wrote a book called "Vanishes into Thin Air" that, that right. is all about this. But um, but yeah, yeah, just rebuilding all the housing stock is you know to make it energy efficient and so on is like going to require so many it's energy inputs. Amount. It's not even yeah. funny. Yeah, you know, um, using energy to to like um dematerialize existing materials right break down existing materials those yeah. are all like really energy uh um and intensive, intensive processes things, yeah. yeah and that's how we get away from using conflict minerals and so on yes we need we need like design mandates that make it easy to decompose and manufacture goods back into yeah. their composite parts but but there's a lot of stuff in landfills that predates that that we're gonna have to figure out how to how to decompose Yes, yes, and how or how to use again. I mean, that was a, what, the most fascinating comment that a mining engineer that I interviewed said was, um, "We can't." Uh, he, he's Australian. He said, "We can't dig shit up after 2050." 
that was yeah and, you know we've got to use what we've got now and and, yeah. and and he said the only place you can mine is landfill and that's yeah. i mean because the only science fiction book i wrote i wrote a science fiction trilogy and Good i don't idea. even want to begin to compare it to the stuff you you know but oh. my first book was quite successful but one of the Think it was set 200 years in the future, and one of the things they did was they were mining a massive landfill that's outside Reading in this country, mm -hmm. and they were and the, and the machine that mined it was it was just like scraping it as it went along, was mm -hmm. sorting out all the products into plastic pellets and you know brick yeah, sure. dust, and, you know which you could do, you know because we've been chucking stuff, we've built mountains, you know there's the, yeah. a freeway here, the M40 going into London, you know, that goes out west is the one I use to get in. And there you go past a sort of hill. It's now got trees on. It's like a forested hill. Well, that didn't used to be there. That used to be a hollow. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. Well, I always thought it was funny because I lived around the corner from Bunnell Cemetery uh, in London. Right. And I never really remarked on it. You know, I walked through this very beautiful old uh, cemetery built in yeah. a plague pit and i realized that eventually that bun hill means bone hill and yes. the reason that it's two meters higher than the grade is that it's just full of dead people it's just full of tens of thousands of dead people yeah, yeah. Does, that's that does put a different spin on it doesn't it yeah. It? yeah yeah bone hill god that is extraordinary yeah i didn't know that but then uh, i mean i think the other one that i'm not sure of, and I, I really lean towards your take on that and, and your take on, uh, you know, the kind of level, the, the sheer gargantuan level of energy storage you'd need to, you know, for this country, for instance, to go through winter, mm -hmm. you know, if we're, you know, we cannot rely on solar to go through winter. I mean, I, I, I use a, an enormous amount of solar power in the summer. Mm -hmm. and a staggeringly tiny amount that I produce for, right. you know, four months of the year, it's really appallingly low. Uh, but the, the one thing I'm seeing and, and hearing about is that, is, and this is I, the thing I've been trying to write just as a, a like an essay, is, our, is our, how, in a way, stilted our imaginations are when it comes to this future because of the technologies that are developing so far. So, for instance there are functioning carbon on carbon batteries in a laboratory at Manchester university at the moment. Now they may never come to fruition. I always think 90% of those, sure. um, an article in wired or clean technica or electric, right. or, you know, right. <laughs> electric about these batteries could da 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 da. And you know, it's the word could Oh no, if they uh -huh. are doing it, tell me about it. <laughs> Cause uh -huh. there's so many things that could, but one of those is going to work. You know, there's going to be a, a system of storing. It's such a, such huge amount of money and time and research and do, brains going into that. Do you know a book called sustainable energy without the hot air? Yes. Yeah. I mean that for me, is like my reality check, right? Because it's, he's treating it like a engineering problem. He's like, you know, yeah. like with Fermi approximation, like what are the number of photons that strike the earth's surface of a day? Yes. Right. That is, yeah. that is the upper limit on solar. Right. Yeah. And since like biofuels are just a, just a less efficient solar, it's also yeah. the upper limit on biofuels and whatever. And, you know, it's a big number, but he's like, that's the number, right? Like yeah. you, you, you know, you anyone who tells you yeah. will get more than that is lying because yeah. there is no more sun than that that strikes the yeah. earth's surface. You need something orbital at that point. You yeah. know, what is the total tidal stress exerted by the moon on the earth? Yeah. You know, that is your complete to to title budget. Yeah. You know, it's always going to be less than that. So, yeah, I really like that book. They've just done one on sustainable food production. That right. is in the post. That right. is a, such a huge topic, I think. That's, a, their, I mean, yeah. Their materials book is amazing. That's where I learned about aluminium. So right. aluminium and concrete, they're the, um, the contribution to uh, climate change from aluminium and concrete is so large that all other material production and refining uh, is a rounding error. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so all of our savings are to be had there, right? I mean, you can eke out changes at the margin, you know, yeah. and what that's, we do. And that's easy. Whatever. It's the low hanging yeah. fruit, isn't it? That's the easy yeah. stuff. Yeah. Cars, but, for instance, easy. Yeah. And, you know, he goes into the, the, some beautiful stuff about like how we make drinks tins and, right the the alloying process that makes it very hard to extract the aluminium when it's done right. which drives the need for virgin aluminium and then there are you know like there are alternative processes that would require retooling but that wouldn't require us that we dig, dig shit out of the ground right yeah. it would it's but it's a major retool yes. to go through the whole uh system of of drinks tins making and you know like when i was growing up in ontario 
uh, the provincial government had a rule that um, all fizzy drinks makers and all brewers had to use standard size bottles and you right. could return them for um, uh, a deposit. Right. And then they would go to a provincial depot, be sterilized, and then ship back out to the fizzy yeah. drinks makers. And, and so that wasn't just one brand of fizzy drinks. No. Was, oh, wow. So Coke genius. bottles weren't shaped like Coke bottles when I was Wow. Growing. Wow. And but you could was, buy Coca-Cola, but it was in the standard bottle. It was in a standard shape bottle. Wow. And it was the drinks manufacturers who insisted on recycling because right. with recycling, they could move us away from reuse and they could get right. their own bottles. Yeah. And so recycling was, was introduced at the behest of industry. Yes. And so the, you know, on the one hand, that's a story about fuckery from big yeah. multinational packaged goods companies. Yeah. On the other hand, it's a story about retooling because yeah. in Ontario, they had no tooling for bottle manufacture. There was right. a standard bottle. And then on a dime, we right. had all of the different shape bottles, right? right? All the the marketing driven bottle shapes. And so we can retool if needed. Yeah. Oh yes, absolutely. Yeah. But that is so that is so <laughs> such a genius simple bit of legislation. I mean, it, and that is one of the things I get confused about because they you know, when people introduce this Cal, California Near Resource Board and the and the stipulation for car manufacturers to have low or zero emission vehicles, you know, such a fine-tuned tiny bit of legislation that was mm -hmm. fought against with you know oh, bare yeah. teeth <laughs> people spitting blood to, to overrule it but it it shifted things and it meant that yeah. you know guys that you will i'm sure some you knew someone i met someone i was in california from silicon valley you know computer scientists went i can do a control system that protects that battery and makes it last longer and blah 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 mm -hmm. you know that's where it came that this next generation did not come out of detroit it came out of silicon valley this, this generation yeah of well and also it means that we need to be um skeptical of the claims of of the large firms like yeah. i'm sympathetic you know i often hear like in the european union right now there's a, a um proposal to ban working encryption again this comes up all the time and right. they say what we need is an encryption system that keeps criminals out but lets cops with warrants in yes and we don't know how to make that encryption <laughs> it's a terrible idea yeah. and whenever whenever you know computer scientists point this out yeah. um you know cops and lawmakers pat them on the head and say like we have faith in your ingenuity, right. right? And we call this the like nerd harder answer, right? right? Well, you can do it. You just need to nerd harder. And so I'm sympathetic to people who say like, look, this kind of retooling is harder than you imagine. Yeah. But also I've seen so many times this kind of foot dragging be used as an excuse. So we yeah. just, um, in Massachusetts, just passed a, a ballot initiative on, right to, on automotive right to repair. Yes, I heard right. about this, yeah. Yeah. There had been a ballot initiative in 2012 on automotive right to repair that passed overwhelmingly 76%. Right. And it um, established that uh, automakers had to provide diagnostic equipment for any wired communication within the car, but not for the wireless communication. Right. And so immediately the auto manufacturers retooled so that all the data went wirelessly. Right. So th the new yeah. ballot initiative, which just passed with 75%, Wow. adds wireless to it. And there's three standardized wireless protocols that come out of standards bodies. There are traditional, li like there are reference libraries for them that they can use and so on. Right. And the auto manufacturers have, had the, have asked the legislation, legislature to delay implementation by three years because they say that it's going to take them three years to retool. And wow. I am like, on the one hand, like I don't want people driving unsafe cars because I agitated for a faster timeline. On the other hand, guys, like yeah. you, you saw the writing on the wall on this one, yeah. right? It wasn't like you, you should have known from 2012 yeah. that this was coming this because come. if it passed with 76%, it was going to pass with 75% in 2020. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, their argument in 2020 was great. It was, um, they had all these ads of like rapist stalkers following people home because they could read the wireless telemetry from their cars. They could find their wow. victims. And I was like, sorry, is your, is your, like whole pitch against uh, anti right to repair that you've turned cars into such disgusting mobile data acquisition platforms yeah. that if anyone could find out what was in our car, they would murder us. Yeah. Like that does not reflect well on <laughs> you guys. No. Like I have a, I have a simple solution. Maybe you should make cars that don't spy on us. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
It is. I mean, that I think uh, the, the one that goes on here is uh, people getting upset about smart meters, which would actually make a the smart meter is not for the person at home. It's for the electricity sure. distribution industry. And yeah, the smart meter knows when you put your kettle on or you stop yeah. do your washing machine. You've got a phone in your pocket. It's always people go, I don't want a smart meter spying on me. You've got to burn your phone, smash it. So let yeah. me quibble with you slightly. <laughs> Here's what I think. It's not a it's a bug and not a feature that your phone spies on you and tells other people what it yes. learns. Wait, yeah. It would be, you know, like you're right that paying attention to what a device does instead of who it does it for and who it does it to is always going to be incomplete. Yeah. But the problem with smart meters is real, right? Like it's it's real in the sense that um, you know, uh after the Maidan demonstrations in Kiev People went home and got text messages because their phones were being surveilled when they when they gathered for the protest, right. saying, "You know, dear citizen, we know what you did tonight. You are now on a list." Well, imagine if they went home in Kiev in February, and it wasn't, "Dear citizen, we know what you did. You're on a list." It's like, Just "Dear citizen, we know what off. you did. We've turned your power off for the night. See how right. you like that, right?" right? The as a uh, and and the thing that actually really worries me about smart meters is if they are adverse to the people who use them, right? If the if the idea is that when the power company thwacks your thermostat down by a couple of degrees, you're, you're, you just physically can't alter what's going on. Right. So in other words, if the device is designed to allow remote parties to set policy on it, irrespective of the wishes of the people who own and use it and whose, whose lives are potentially at risk from its yeah. misuse, then anyone who compromises that system which is a thing that we should assume will happen eventually, yeah. right? Being a good engineer doesn't mean you assume things never break. That's, that's the basis of, for not putting yes. lifeboats on the Titanic, right? Yeah. That doesn't make you an optimist. It makes you an asshole. Yeah. So if you assume that the, uh, that the system will eventually have a defect, then if by design it cannot be overridden at the console by the person who potentially has their life on the line there, yeah then that is of enormous risk. Right. And so if we can find a, if we can, if the basis for a smart meter is we have all reached a social contract where we are happy to have our meters thwack down by a couple of degrees when, when peak load hits. Uh, and we also understand that like, if you're, you got the fever or you've got a sick baby or whatever, you might need to adjust it back up again, but that no one's going to take advantage of it. If the social contract is intact and the point of the technology, the smart meter is a, to help you understand your own usage and yeah. B to spare you the drudgery of getting an alert that says, please adjust your thermostat by two yeah. degrees. Yeah. Then, then that is great. Right. But if it's like getting the buggers to behave, if that's the basis for this thing, right? Like we'll show you how to, how to live green. Yeah. It is a recipe for all kinds of bad yeah. stuff. Yeah. And it's all down to the relationship. And you know, like it, the, I'm not surprised that people in the UK and the land of deregulated power and just so many chancers and grifters operating power companies yeah. and power resale companies and having the worst practices certified by the likes of, you know, PwC and, and other criminals who were complicit in the Carillion collapse and so on, that they don't trust that technology. It's the same as track and trace, right? The, yeah. the, you know, uh, exposure notification, I don't know if it will work or not. I think the jury's still out. But assuming it does work, its major impediment is trust. Yeah. And you don't get trust by saying, well, we've installed it. You can't uninstall it. That is the opposite. That's, that just encourages yeah. people who are at high risk, like people who have a drug addiction or people who patronize a sex worker or people who are undocumented to, to leave their device at home. Yeah. So that, so that, and, and then you just have the people who are at the most risk of contracting and spreading the disease <laughs> being the ones who, who are yeah. the lacuna, right? Yeah. And so, you know, you, you must establish a social contract for this stuff to work. And it's true of all of the green measures. It's true of this, this utopia I sketched out at the start of our call, yeah. because otherwise, you know, how do you know that the person who's like favored by the programmer isn't getting every day off? Well, you know, yes. you have to go and grind away. I mean, think of the, yeah. the, the hay that the Tories made out of the idea that some of us are up at seven in the morning with our blinds open, getting ready for work. And then all the, 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 uh, you know, people living fat off the public purse were just lazing about on their sofas all day watching, yeah. uh, you know, watching ITV. Like th that is a powerful motivator for uh, sowing distrust and magnifying yeah. distrust and eliminating social cohesion. And if, if our planet and species have a future, it is in social cohesion. Yeah.
No, I, 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 I love listening to you because I come up with this sort of very, it's almost, I, now, I can now hear myself, it's more or less a daily mail, super shallow analysis of the complexities of smart meters and phones. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then you explain, I go, it's, I, I am totally 100% wrong on that. But, I mean, I but do Robert, think- Robert, it's not think, wrong. It's just incomplete. It, it, it's incomplete. Uh, exactly. No, that's what is frustrating, <laughs> how accurate you are yeah. on that. Because you're, I mean, you know, there's plenty of, you know, uh, uh, tech doom naysayers who go, yeah, if we have anything, in and you're not saying that, and you've never said that because you've always been right. very involved in the technology, but it is the way it's, the, it's our understanding of it, the general public's fairly low level of understanding of what they're doing. I mean, my, uh, you know, whenever I say to people, well, your phone listens to you and it knows what you're doing, but it doesn't really, ma- I say it doesn't really matter unless you Unless right. it matters. <laughs> right. But well, it's always upsetting because you think, oh, it, it bloody is, you know, and all that's those. Like, that's, but that's like climate, right? Like it's one yeah. of those things that by the time you can appreciate the consequences because you've, you've lived through their, their yeah. precursors, it might be too late. It might be too late right? to think about it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We need to accelerate the moment of peak indifference yeah. and start climbing towards peak, inter- peak interest, yes. right? Because the, the, if, if peak indifference uh, arrives at the moment before the collapse yeah you know then then the the my version of this is like yes i finally care about rhino populations now that there's only one yeah. left but given yeah. that there's only one left why don't we find out what he tastes like yeah right yeah. that <laughs> denial can lead directly to nihilism yeah and yeah. so yet to to you know because like i'm a, i'm terrified of what can happen with technology it's just that i'm also excited yeah. about what can happen with technology yeah. just yeah. like i'm terrified about what can happen with access to to modern energy systems and yeah. i'm excited about what can happen with access yeah. to modern energy yeah. systems Corey, it's been absolutely fantastic i'm so pleased we, we oh, did likewise. this and I, I would love to catch up with you again well when your when your next yeah. book comes out when your energy book comes out i can't wait oh absolutely yeah, yeah that would be great i would really like that Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode. I've put um, links in the show notes for this episode uh, for uh, uh, Corey's work and his webpage and all the stuff he does. He's doing so much. Uh, you know, it's very difficult to kind of to praise it <laughs> down to one or two things. He's, a, he's an extraordinarily productive man um, and an absolute charmer. So I really hope you enjoyed that. Uh, you know, please do tell your friends and family about the Fully Charged Show podcast and maybe mention the fabulous guest we have on here. We've got a lot of brilliant people coming up in the next few weeks um i'm very busy recording podcasts at the moment it's kind of easy because we're all stuck indoors uh, <clears throat> so please do uh, subscribe to the fully charged show podcast um and uh, if you are, are have any interest in the shows we make uh, must uh, you please um, uh, you don't have to sorry i said must that's very far too aggressive we would be very appreciative if you had a glance at the um Fully Charged Show page on YouTube, youtube.com slash Fully Charged Show. Uh, there's over 500 episodes there covering everything from electric cars to planes to bikes to trucks to diggers, uh, everything, and solar PV and battery storage and the future of all the things that we've just been discussing with Corrie. Um, and that's all. As always, if you have been, thank you for listening. Yeah,